welcome to hypnosis for relaxation, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And my name is Jason Newland. So, this recording is based upon a request. So, um, I don't know if we do. Oh, excuse me. I always get tired when I do these recordings. I'm going to read you the message I've received, but I won't tell you who it's from. Okay, so... um, Where is it? Okay. Okay, I broke up with my fiancé two years ago and I'm still desperately seeking help wherever I can find it and I wanted to know um, I want you to know that your anxiety podcast has been a saving grace for those unbearable nights so thank you Um, so it says here I want to explore more of your work um, would you be so kind as to help a broken girl pick up the pieces with your guidance? Thank you so much for existing, existing and being so giving as to share your background on a free podcast. You're clearly a very good man and I feel honoured to have stumbled across you. So... Um, so she, I replied and says, thank you for your quick reply. What can I do to get my hands on... I don't know. So I'm just trying to read it. Uh, so... Okay, here we go. I was curious if you could make a hypnosis if requested. I lost my fiancé two years ago and I've had all the pills, all the doctors... I'm actually considering the electroshock treatment therapy because I kind of cannot get over the trauma of the abuse. My ex was a sociopath or path of some variety. I would love your opinion on it if hypnosis could work for me. Of course, I would be willing to pay you for your work. I just desperately want to stop being triggered by everything in life. It's being excruciating. Um... Well, first of all, I don't charge for anything I do, so this is free. I don't do not do this to make money. Um, and there are no adverts on the podcast either. The do, 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 what else? But the rest is, yeah, I will try to focus on this sort of... It's such a wide... It's... It, a wide subject as far as triggers go because everybody has triggers all of us and they're not they're not all negative it can be nice triggers you know it's like looking at a picture of your grandchild and someone I'm, I'm not sure when everyone that listens to me is in their 70s but I'm just saying someone looking at a picture of their grandchild would feel wonderful inside um, or sad they may have lost a grandchild you know depending on the situation I look at a picture of my nan well from here I can't see it because my eyesight is so rubbish and but when I do look at a picture of my nan who's passed away five and a half years ago I just there's a warmness there you know so that's a trigger I guess but it's not an extreme trigger. So we've got different types of triggers. There's those that trigger a feeling. 
but the nice feelings aren't a problem, so we don't class them as triggers, do we? So, you see someone mentions the TV show Friends, or, um, you know, one of the characters from Friends, or maybe says one of the catchphrases from Friends. I'm trying to think of one. Uh, How are you doing, as an example? People that love friends may feel warm. Might be a nice trigger for them. And if, uh, I'm talking about friends, a television show, by the way. That it might feel really good inside, like oh, and start thinking, well, I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch Friends tonight when I get home from work. I'll watch an episode, and I'll watch my favourite one, where um, not they all get eaten by bears, but you know whatever it could be. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't watch all of the episodes. I did used to watch it though. And, but getting eaten by bears probably wouldn't be a good trigger with it. But so the nice triggers aren't something that we take any notice of necessarily, and perhaps we should. Just to even out the playing field, you know. Just to realise that the word trigger isn't a negative word. When we probably class it as being a negative word. Because we focus on negative triggers. So technically everything in life can be a trigger. You know, if you go onto Facebook forums or pages or groups, especially things uh, like bipolar group, and someone will put trigger warning at the beginning in capital letters. Everything can be a trigger warning. And if you're on a bipolar group, chances are that any topic that comes up could be a trigger to somebody. Uh, so it's, it almost seems like you should be prepared for that in a way. But saying that, I remember I once opened up I watched a Facebook video and I wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. And it was scenes from an abattoir. And I didn't know that's what was going to be on the video. I just, uh, because I think it just opened up and started playing, you know, on Facebook. Sometimes they do, don't they, if you hover over them. This this is a few years back. I was like, oh. Now that, that triggered me, but in a different way. It triggered me as a, like just really grossed me out and shocked. I was shocked from by what I saw. And you know, this it's easy for that to happen. But I guess that's not really the kind of triggers we're we're looking at here. So I feel if we accept the fact that we all have triggers. Therefore, if you have triggers that trigger off something and a negative emotion, therefore we have to also have triggers to trigger positive emotions and nice feelings, pleasurable feelings, positive well-being kind of feelings. That in itself can start to change the way you see these triggers. I mean, you could see the trigger almost like you're being... They're just strings above your head and you're being manipulated by a puppeteer to be reactive continuously. So the puppeteer pulls on one string and your left arm goes up. 
and almost like you have no control over it. But that's not true though, is it? Because we do have control. I heard, uh, I was watching someone and they said, um, if you can turn, if you can sort of change from being a victim into a survivor, then that changes your mindset. And when it comes to being the target of crime or abuse or, you know, endless amount of things, cruelty, uh, in this case we were talking about um, mental and emotional abuse during a relationship, So you can't get rid of the word victim because the person was a victim. We have all been victims of something. Whether it's a victim of violence or a victim of being targeted for bullying or theft. uh, Maybe racism, sexism, homophobia, hate of some kind. We've all had, you know... Even someone that's uh, lived the most, how some would class as like perfect life and never really had any major problems, they've still been a victim. They've been victimized. And it might be simply because they speak differently. They might have, might be an educator at Oxford and got into a pub and they might not even know that they were being victimised and being made fun of by the people behind them because they they talk posh and the other people was like, you know, just talking not posh. And the way they were being treated behind their back affected the way they were being treated to their face. And they may not have been aware of that. So, it's, you know, it can even be that subtle. And for some people, they can really get in touch with that anger inside them. Well, who cares about someone that's rich and... Well, you've just been triggered then, haven't you? So that's the thing. People get triggered by listening to me talking. Even though this is about triggers. It's easy. Easiest thing in the world to get triggered. But saying that, the flip side is. It takes energy to do something about it. And I'm not talking about. uh, Changing how you feel so that you're not, you know, you don't have the emotions. I'm talking about having the emotions to express them. So if you feel you're triggered by something that someone said, you felt they have said something sarcastic and and then suddenly you, you sort of start getting angry. Maybe you feel confident enough or antisocial enough to start shouting, you know, or whatever. So... Most people wouldn't do anything. They'd keep it inside. But it still needs addressing. But that takes a lot of energy. To get angry. Or to hold it. To hold that feeling. To hold any feeling takes a lot of energy. Because it's not natural. We're too fluid. As human beings. We're not supposed to be holding on to any one particular emotion. Emotions come, emotions go. You feel this way now, a few seconds you feel something different. It may not be completely different from how you're feeling, but it'll be a version of how you're feeling. 
It might be the same intensity. Generally, I mean, there are some situations, but like normal life, and that's what I'm classing as trigger being triggered. Because if you're in the middle of a blazing row and you're already angry, then you're not being triggered by what they say. You're already triggered. You're already in that zone of being angry. Of course, you can get that extra energy when they say something cruel. But you're already there. But to go from zero miles an hour to 60, you know, I'm not a driver, but most people can probably rec um, you know, relate to that. To go so quick from being literally standing still emotionally. It's a lot of energy. A lot of energy. So to keep that feeling going, it's not really realistic. It's that car is not going to keep going at 60 miles an hour for any huge length of time or 150 miles an hour, you know, more like. Apart from the fact that it's illegal, I think everywhere, other than on a racetrack. But to keep going full throttle in a car at its maximum speed is possibly problematic for the car. Putting a lot of pressure on the car, you're going to run out of petrol pretty quick. Or you get pulled over by the police. You know, various different things. Or eventually someone, you'll come to a traffic jam. And you'll have to stop. Because other things that need your attention... This, this, this trigger, this thing, it can get your attention. You give it your attention. You don't actually have to do anything. All you need to do, well, you don't need to, but all, what you can do is just give it your attention. Notice it. I'm a very famous saying. When I say famous, I mean popular amongst humans is the term he or she made me feel that way. You made me feel whatever it was because of what you said. You made me feel. No, they didn't. And I'm not talking from a perspective of being some calm, chilled out, perfect human. I mean, I'm pretty perfect. I'm pretty 99% there, but yeah, sure. I'm coming from being highly volatile, easily triggered person with a personality disorder, diagnosed. So I... I know what of I speak, as it were. But I only know what it feels like to be me. When I was a counsellor, I got to know other people's perspectives as well. Uh, reading therapy books and studying, got a degree in counselling. So I got to get a, an idea of how other people might experience the world. But ultimately... The only important thing is how you experience the world when it comes to your own internal feelings. Because if I say to you, I'll stop reacting. Uh, and this is going to, what I'm about to say is going to be extreme. It's the most pathetic thing that anyone could ever say. But I'm going to say it. And I don't mean it when I say it, by the way. So, if someone says to you, 
uh, you're not the only one that got abused as a kid. I got abused. I know three people that got abused. Why are you making such a big deal about it? Well, I had it worse than you. That's that's something that I'm, I think someone would say without realizing the absolute damage they could be causing another person as well as themselves, because they've almost discounted or uh, their own experiences as well as being unimportant because other people experience it. And that's not the case. Yet the most important person in this situation is is the person that had that experience. No one else. Because we're the ones, and I've, I've been through that myself, personally, as a very, very young child. So... Even though it affects other people, I had two brothers with me and sort of went through, I guess, the same thing. But I have to do with my experience of it. And no one else can deal with it but me. In my, you know, my life. And I've been, I have been to years and years years of counselling and therapy so I haven't just ignored it I did ignore it for the first 27 years of my life I mean this is stuff that happened when I was about 4 4 or 5 you know so it's very very young maybe younger but then up to the age of 27 didn't acknowledge it until it was kind of forced upon me to acknowledge it because suddenly it was in the paper about another relative of mine that went through the same thing and he was going into great detail. It's like, wow, talk about a trigger. Wow, man, that was a trigger. So... I realise I get off the subject sometimes, don't worry, I'm coming back. But I'm sharing some of my experience, not, I don't want no one feeling sorry for me. I've done enough of that in my own life, I don't trust me. I've had enough pity, self-pity, um, to cover the entire country, just towards myself. I felt very sorry for myself, a long time. And I still sometimes do. Nowhere near the amount I used to. But I sometimes do. Sometimes it's very comfortable to have, you know, to just soak in self-pity. It's a comfortable feeling, especially uh, in my case, having spent a lot of time doing it. And part of that process is to blame everybody else for everything. It's a really perfect scenario if you want to stay a victim. Blame everybody else. Everything else, you know, it's everyone else's fault that I've got no money. It's everyone else's, it's everyone, someone else's fault that I don't have a job. The only person's fault, really, in that scenario was the person that hurt me. And the ironic thing is I felt responsible. Now I'm not going to go into details, but I I was actually active in it. Uh, in a one particular remember a situation. And so therefore I thought well you know, I'm I'm the one to blame. Yeah, all the other stuff, like everyone else is to blame for that. 
So during my childhood, I took the blame for everything. You know, I felt I was responsible. If someone fell over in the street, I felt that I was responsible for that. If um, a, a tree fell down, somehow I felt, well, I must have done something to cause that. A car crash or something, you know, even though it's no logic at all. And when I became an adult, I think I turned that round into blaming others. And part of that might have been the awareness that I wasn't responsible for bad things happening to other people. But my brain couldn't comprehend it for some reason. You know, it just it flipped the other side, like, well, therefore, it must be other people's fault for why my life is like it is. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, it can be... It doesn't have to be someone's fault all the time. You know, the old play the blame game. And it's far from a game, is it? It's just... Why do things need to be someone else's fault or our own fault? So I don't like to take the blame for stuff that I've that when things bad happen. But at the same time, I don't like to push the blame on other people either. And by no means are all my triggers gone. But there are ways of working around it. There are ways of maybe looking at things. Sometimes just by thinking about something differently changes. And it's like a fine tuning. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. Um, Just in the same way, you can have 10 people with, let's say, lower back pain. You can take take someone to see uh, a rom- aromatherapist, one to see an acupuncturist, one to see a uh, Reiki uh, therapist. You can see one to see uh, reflexology, another one to see Indian head massage, another one, you know, so on and so forth. I've run out of uh, therapies, by the way. But... You know, everyone's got their own thing that works for them. Well, you could have one person go to all of those different therapies and they find that reflexology is the thing that helps the most, or Reiki. Yet what's going to happen? If someone goes to Reiki, for example, or or reflexology, or acupuncture, or acupressure. I did think of another one. Guaranteed, if they've got like a friendship group or a family, if they've got contact with other human beings, chances are someone's going to be flippant and put down what's just happened. Oh, that's just a bunch of bullshit. Oh, Reiki, you don't think, didn't even touch her. You know? Doesn't sound like a very happy ending. You know, well, this put downs. When actually your experience is what's important. Because that's the reason why I'm not saying to you that the triggers don't exist. I'm not saying to you that your experience is unimportant and it's, it's the wrong way to feel. Or, no, don't feel like that. You shouldn't feel this way. Even though technically you could say they don't exist. You can't hold them in your hand. You can't wrap them up and give them to someone for a Christmas present. Why would you? But you know what I mean. It's not a physical thing. So 
So these triggers is personal and you experience is your experience and when I was doing counselling I remember one of the other trainees said I've got a client and she's just clearly lying all the time just makes most almost like she's making stuff up what do I do? My answer was, because it was like a group, you know, sort of uh, supervision. I said, just believe her. Who are you to decide whether or not she's telling the truth or not? I mean, that, there's, in a sense, that's the same as someone going up to uh, a therapist or some specialist in genital warts, isn't it? And saying, I've got a friend that's got a genital wart. And he's really concerned. Um, should he see a doctor? Should he make sure he doesn't get in contact with his girlfriend so that she doesn't catch it? What what should he do? What should my friend do? Now the person who's an expert on genital warts is going to obviously assume that it's for him, but probably not care. Because it doesn't matter. Because the end result is someone is benefiting from that. And I don't think, rightly or wrongly, I just don't think that people will go to therapy unless they're getting something from it. Just That's my opinion, and it doesn't matter. If someone says something to me in therapy, I believe, I would believe every single thing they say even if they're contradicted and you can hear the contradiction because I can I recognise lies and not lies but contradictions because when I hear the contradiction I remember the original thing that was said it's just the kind of brain I've got for some reason uh, but I don't say anything well, I didn't still don't even when friends do it because what is that but confrontation and probably a trigger, a trigger to them, which is not really what I want. So I suppose I should point out that I'm going to make in a few of these, which is possibly a nice thing for some people. It might be, oh my God, really? You're really going to make in more of these? What is the point? Why are you adding them to your relaxation for anxiety and stress? Well... The reason I'm adding them, why I'm making them, putting them onto this podcast, instead of doing a separate podcast, which I might in the future, if I do enough of them. The reason is because I was asked to do it. And I'm not saying this to sum this up, because I'm nowhere finished this recording. I want to talk. I, I can talk for a long time. Um, the... The reason, because when someone's triggered... The nice feelings, they don't class that as a trigger. Maybe you will now start to sort of change your thinking. So I was triggered. Yeah, you were triggered because you saw an advert for Disney World and it reminded you of when you took your family to Disney World and at the time of your life or reminded you of the holiday that you're, you've got booked for two years' time to go to you know Disney World. Or maybe reminded you of, you know, sending tickets to me so I could go to Disney World for my 50th birthday. Yeah, okay. But that's still a trigger. So triggers don't ever always have to be horrible, bitter tasting things. They can be beautiful, wonderful feelings. But when you start to kind of get your your mind wrapped around that idea, which I think was factual, it's not even really an idea, but, you know, we can leave it as an idea, but I would say it's facts. It's just as factual as there being negative triggers. If there's negative triggers, there has to be positive triggers. If there's day, there has to be night. 
you know, if there's being asleep, there has to be being awake. You can't, there has to be. You know, there's a flip side. Maybe not to everything, but in this case, to this, there is. There's a flip side. And the flip side is... Positive, nice, lovely triggers where you feel wonderful. Now, in NLP, in NLP, part of the training of neuro linguistic programming is to learn to set up these triggers triggers of positivity, triggers of feeling wonderful. So that you can fire them yourself. So there's and a positive trigger is when you fire that at the same time as the negative trigger has happened. It changes it. It changes it. Uh, just in the same way as if you've got a, a basin full of, you know, half full of hot water. It can be so hot you can't even put your finger in to pull the plug out. You know, it's that hot. But you put some cold water in there. You haven't got to put equal amount of cold water in to make it um, cooler. Just a small amount of water. And then suddenly it's not even hot enough to wash your hands in anymore. You need to add some more hot water to make it a proper washable, hand washable temperature. So the hot and cold water at the same time changes it. I mean, I do that with, um, sometimes I'm a bit lazy. I don't necessarily want to fill the, fill the, um, the sink up with water. So I wash my hands under the hot tap. It's quite a slow burner in a sense. It's, it gets warm, warm enough to wash my hands. And then sometimes it gets really hot and I have to stick my hands under the cold tap. And then sometimes I'll just move between the two, which is a little bit like coming out of the sauna and jumping into one of those cold pools, those freezing cold pools. You don't feel it. You don't feel it being freezing cold because of that dramatic change in temperature so quick. But it feels different. So, if you've got a feeling or memory that's really nice, for example, let's say the, <clears throat> you could carry a picture around in your pocket of it could be somebody that's really really important to you or was important to you someone that when you look at the picture you feel good inside it could be your child it could be for me it would be Andre I'm a little boy Andre the ferret or it would be a picture of my nan that's the two pictures I would have Or maybe a picture of a chocolate eclair, you know, because I quite like them. But I'm just saying something that makes you feel good. So when a trigger's fired off externally, when you've allowed that to happen, the you can so you got that crappy feeling. You know, the chemicals have been stimulated and got this feeling in your body, you know, it's just anxiety, stress, anger, all kinds of mixed emotions going on. And then you look at your picture. Now, you know that nothing in the world is going to change the way that you respond to that picture. You know, nothing, no negativity can ever be connected to that. Because, you know, so if I've got, I've got a picture of Andre on my phone... And I just love him to bits. So, or video, and I've got a little video of him just running around, or 
got one of him eating his food or me tickling his tummy. That feels nice. It calm, that's calming for me. Now, you might not have the same feeling when you look at that picture as you do normally. It might not be that feeling of like wonderful endorphins and stuff. Because you've also got all the other crappy stuff going on at the same time. But that can be the equivalent of the cold water in a basin full of hot water. It just cools everything down very, very quickly. So all that negative energy loses its strength and it goes floppy. And it can't do anything, can't perform, can't do anything. The next time you look at that picture, it might be a separate situation. You might just be sitting on a train and just thought, oh, look at a picture. And you have a completely different feeling. You'll have that normal, natural high. And the only reason you didn't feel that way is because it was that feeling was being used to soften and to almost an antidote to the negative, painful emotional feelings that you had. So that's, what, that's one thing that you could do. Take a picture with you somewhere, or maybe look at your phone. Some people do uh, kind of the equivalent by listening to some music. Because it makes them feel better, makes them feel more uplifted. But some people might not want to do that when they've just been triggered. Because they may not think, they might not be thinking about it. So, in a way, if you think about the being triggered in a sense of, first of all, it's just a word among millions of others that we have, but it's it's natural, it's a reaction. It's just a reaction to something external, not internal, external. And I think I realised one thing happened, and I've talked about this in the past, when I was going through my really, really, really extreme anxiety days when I was, this was 2003, 2004. Now, in the summer 2004, I mean, you know, pretty much anything seemed to be able to trigger me not just uh, from the anxiety perspective but emotionally as well and I think what happens sometimes and it did with me is when I started having the anxiety attacks I was forced or my body my mind forced me to actually give it attention. I was no longer able to just ignore the feelings because they were too big. You know, it's, it's easy to ignore a bit of trap wind. It's easy to ignore a little bit of a fuzzy head, maybe even a headache, you know, take a tablet can't ignore a migraine you know it's, I, I had migraines when I was younger I don't know why but I just had a couple of years of them when I was probably caused by stress but I didn't realise at the time and you know you can't ignore a migraine in fact you shouldn't ignore a migraine 
you do whatever you need to to relieve it and to give yourself some space and love and be kind to yourself and allow the process to go through you know take medication whatever you need to do but this isn't about migraines and I'm not an expert other than just they had a horrible and I think the anxiety forced me to not be able to just ignore stuff anymore because the stuff, the emotions I was having were so strong and the reactions I was having was so strong that it felt, not physically, but it felt almost like I'd had a layer of skin removed from my body and I was just ultra sensitive but in a horrible way probably didn't need to add that did I but I'm ultra sensitive and it felt as if the I almost was walking around with calluses on my skin before so people weren't able to push my triggers although they were but I had such a vicious tongue on me that I could put someone down within two seconds of them even getting to push it or even if it looked like someone was going to push I, you know I was very defensive for most of my adult life and yeah still, still can be when you get to the point where you realise well People can't really hurt me. Of course, if, if someone attacks you with an axe, samurai sword, of course, or, or a gun, of course they can hurt you physically. Or if someone comes up to you and starts um, shouting racial abuse at you, or it's going to hurt. doesn't matter how tough you are. doesn't matter. You know, it's not about being tough. It's about being human. It's going to hurt. Of course it is. But it doesn't have to ruin your life. And to be fair, I think we need to give ourselves a break. Because we talk about triggers, we're not talking about serious stuff. So if someone came up to me and I you know I've, I had well, I had a, a girlfriend from Trinidad when I was about 21 and I had a bit of racial abuse towards me um, from young black men actually coming up to her and saying what are you doing with that white man can you find a black man good enough for you he's like really so I was was quite shocked this was in London and I was like wow once once someone said it from a distance I said no I couldn't but you look quite nice and he, he left. But that's a reason to get annoyed and upset. I'm not saying that's the only reason. I'm just saying some there are some reasons to get upset. So, so dealing with your triggers isn't saying you should never be upset about anything ever. No. This isn't a spiritual journey. This isn't trying to be a perfect human being. I don't want to be perfect. You might do brilliant. But you know what? I don't want to be perfect because the journey is too damn long. I'm just happy to know that I've not really hurt anybody. Not purposely. You know, I'm... So I said that once at the Buddhist center to me. So what do you mean you don't want to be perfect? No. What are we, why? First of all, what is perfect? That's going to be a person's... Because some people might think that somebody's perfect, but another person might not. You know, so... Perfect. I want to be a perfect human being. No, I don't. 
So I don't aim for those kind of heights just to be a decent person, just to be able to be able to deal with stuff from the past, you know, from a PTSD perspective maybe. And we've all been traumatised by something that's happened to us in our past. And again, that's something I learned as a counsellor. I had someone that was traumatised by something. I'm not even going to say what it was because confidentiality in that. But if I said it, you'd think, you might think, well, that wasn't a big deal. It traumatised her. Seriously traumatised her emotionally. And she was panicky, couldn't get on a bus, couldn't go out. And, and this, you know, if I told you what it was, I'm not going to, I'm saying, if I told you what it was, you might think, Rice, yeah, I can see how that would be annoying or how that would be upsetting for a child or disappointing, but not traumatising. So we're all different. And I started off down this route of therapy having studied uh, Milton Erickson back in I started studying him in 98 1998 and the first thing that really the two things that came to me was hypnosis can be used well three things hypnosis can be used to help people that's the end of that sentence so it's like oh okay it can be helped, it can really, really be used to help people in really amazing ways. But it's not, it doesn't have to be in a way that you would expect. And you can do it conversationally. It doesn't have to be, now close your eyes and we're going to go down an escalator and we're going to imagine walking through a forest. And that's brilliant stuff, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's about your mind focusing it's about opening up possibilities for the future so just by listening something always sticks and if I might do my best to keep it positive I say the odd silly thing along the way but something changes Something changes and you may feel different and not know why. You might be listening to me and thinking, okay, I've just spent 50 minutes or an hour listening to this bloke from England talking in this very eloquent way, almost perfection. <laughs> And you might be thinking, well, oh, that's, that's a waste of time. What did I do that for? But then notice how you're feeling. Notice your level of comfort, relaxation. Notice how calm your mind is. Even though we've been talking about the opposite to calmness, really. But something opens up, something changes when your focus changes. And that's something that I kind of learned from, well, that's what I decided to learn from Milton Erickson. It's not about technique necessarily. It can be. But in a way to reach a large audience. Because of course if it was just you sitting in a chair in front of me. I could ask you some questions. And then I can focus on each one issue independently. And do exercises and techniques. I can't do that in a recording. When I'm doing it for hundreds or maybe thousands of people. That will be listening to this. So... For me, the other thing is everybody's different. Everybody's different.
everybody. Don't assume you know what another person feels because you don't. None of us do. We love to think we do, but we don't. You could have had exactly the same experience. And you can relate. And you can talk in a room and say the same things. Oh, I relate to that. Of course, you can relate to things, but it's different. Everybody experiences it differently. Because even in group meetings, we might not say everything. We might not talk about how we're actually feeling, the thoughts we have when we're on our own. Maybe the thoughts we're having when someone else is talking during that meeting. We're all different. And I think that's a good thing, personally. But it means if you treat everybody like they're an individual, then I think life, that just seems to be the right way to do it. We're all different. And we're constantly changing as well. So you're different now to how you were an hour ago before you press the play button on this recording. I'm different to how I was an hour ago. Because whether I know it or not, I've learned something from this. I've learned something. And I'm not reading off a script, but you can tell I'm not reading off a script. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be some kind of organisation and direction to the recording if I was reading off a script. I put trust in my mind. I put trust in coming up with the right words, the right things to say, and it's a, it's just a, it's just a conversation about triggers. It's a conversation about the possibilities of, you know, realising that there are positive triggers as well. Which means that not all the triggers you have are negative. Which then reduces the amount of negative triggers there are. Because maybe 50%, maybe less, maybe more, are positive. So that's kind of less triggers to actually deal with. Instead of having in your mind that, oh, too many triggers, too many triggers. What I noticed was back in 2004 that I was able to be triggered by external circumstances that weren't even real and it made me laugh and it changed the way that I felt it changed the way that I perceived a trigger so basically back then my body was practically raw you know in a sense of I had muscles um, in my leg palpitating or convulsing I don't know what you want to call them but just moving on their own I had muscles in my arms doing that it wasn't because I was muscly it just it was a stress thing 100% never happened to me in my life until those two years and the muscle would just be start working on its own just thought you know um, I said I had it in my legs sometimes it was in my calf Sometimes I had it in my eye, eye, eyelash, eyelash, my eyelid, like my eyelid would flicker. You know, and I, I tried the uh, nutritional side of things, thinking, oh, I'm not getting enough 
potassium and so you know I, I took vitamins and made sure that I was eating pretty well wasn't drinking any alcohol at all for the whole of 2004 it was down to the stress levels and I seemed to be able to just be triggered by anything just but then I blamed that on the anxiety it's like I see anxiety and I was sitting in the office in a job that I had I had a little part time job in a shop that was during my 2004 the year where I got into lots of debt trying to get by you know on part time wages while I recovered that was the idea anyway I had this buzzing in my groin and I went into a panic like instantly instantly because I was having these muscle spasms anyway and to suddenly have it in my groin it's like oh my god and it was my phone on silent on vibrate and two things I noticed first of all those feelings of panic can disappear instantly it's not a waterfall that you can't shut off it's a tap that you can shut off and I was in a full blown panic attack seriously I was like really struggling to breathe really like all that stuff and then realising that it was just my phone I started laughing and I couldn't believe it I just there's something external because I didn't really think it was external at the time I don't know I thought it was me. It was something going on inside of me. I didn't think that I could be triggered externally. I wasn't really that aware of uh, triggers back then. Not really. A little bit, but you know, not not to the extent that I became. And as I said, I realised at that moment that anxiety can disappear as quickly as it comes which I didn't know before never had happened before I'd be stuck with it sometimes for hours end up going to the hospital uh, thinking I was dying you know literally that's what how it used to be but not this time disappeared instantly And then I started laughing. Laughing the fact that it it disappeared instantly. And the fact that Andre has to come and do a poo just as I'm talking. I found it funny, first of all, that it was my phone that triggered that panic attack. And also the fact that Wow, it can just disappear instantly. I'll give you an idea, it disappeared quicker than a Cadbury's cream egg. Andre, I don't really need the sound effects of you doing that. I suppose this is the first part. I'm going to be doing more of these recordings on triggers. As I kind of think of some ideas. But when it comes to the past. You know, everything's in the past, isn't it? Literally, you know. What I said then was in the past. When I said it. 
is in the past. You can't change the past. You can change how you feel about the past. So there are ways of doing that. There are ways of changing. You can even change your memories of the past. However, our memories of the past get changed anyway. They get distorted naturally. And this is scientifically proven that our memories are not real. Not in the way that we remember. Doesn't mean what happened didn't happen, because of course, you know, especially with you know, lots of things that would have happened. But if something happens regularly, so let's say, not focusing on a bad thing, let's say going to work, traveling to work, with a colleague eventually those journeys will sort of mingle into kind of one ish and there might be a particular memory where maybe you got a flat tire but that memory of the flat tire might mix in with another memory where you stop to get some coffee or it might mix in with another memory of where the person you're traveling with decides to tell you that he likes to dress up as a banana at the weekends. Fancy dress. I mean, you, you you know, you go ice skating, the banana cabaret, the ice skating troupe or whatever. So, and then it can be like, oh. And when you try and sort of decipher which is which, it can get hard. And that's because our minds don't really care very much for specific details necessarily especially when it comes to emotion it doesn't seem to you know the older you get the less specific things can be you can remember some things but still even people that might be in their 80s and 90s saying oh remember this happened and it's still probably going to be a mixed memory they're just not going to realize it is and these tests have been done with people that were adamant that this actual happened, this thing happened in the way it did. And then it got tested by maybe even uh, video evidence of the event. And it's different from what actually really happened. Maybe slightly, but it's still going to be different. So we all perceive things differently. And if something isn't particularly important, we might not remember it. And sometimes if something's really horrible, we might we might try and forget it, which could cause it to sort of mix in with other stuff, which means it could make a trigger more easily available. So connecting something horrible that happened in a house with that house even though you may have lived in that house and still live in that house, may have lived there for 20 years. For that house to be a trigger to what happened. So thinking of that house is not, it's not acceptable for that to be a trigger for you to feel a member of that stuff that happened because that's not what the house is about. That was something that happened it's not the house you know just like a car crash you might have a car crash but it might be a horrible one but then every time you look at your driving license does it have any effect on you probably not driving license but it could because a driving license is connected to driving isn't it which is connected to that driving that car you know so these triggers can be at weird places at weird times but they're natural but you don't have to put up with them not all of them 
And what happens, you can address it directly, say, okay, well, this is a trigger, think of it as a tree, I'm going to dig that tree up by the roots, and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig up so I can see all the roots, pour petrol all over the roots that are still in the earth, and I'm going to set fire to that thing, and just watch it burn, and it will never, ever be the same again, it can't be, can it? You can do that with one of your triggers. Think of it as a tree. This is a little practical thing you could do. It might sound a little bit violent, actually, you know, setting fire to something, but I think when it comes to something that's horrible, uh, a trigger that ultimately leads to, or has led to, excessive anxiety, stress, panic and just general, generally horrible feelings and maybe you can look at that trigger focus on that trigger and imagine it's that tree or a tree and you can see it's been dug up around the, the stem of the tree you can see the roots so the tree's still standing up. But how long is it going to stand up once you pour that petrol all into the, amongst the roots, splash it against the tree as well, and just stand safely back and then send someone else to, to, sit, to, to light it? You can get right back, you know. Maybe stand in the helicopter and just like watch it from a distance. And eventually, even if the tree doesn't fall down, it's ruined and then it's, it's, it's done. It's no longer a tree once it's been burnt to bits. And it changes because connected to that tree which is that trigger is those emotions it's all, almost if you think about the tree being upside down and that trigger being the top of the tree and it's being pushed but underneath or you can think about up being up right way up. You push the top of the tree, it triggers those emotions. But it's all these different roots going to different places. It's all connected to, you know, for example, the, the lady that sent me the message talking about our ex boyfriend who had been abusive, controlling, and emotionally harmful so those roots could go to all those different times all those different things all those different events connected to those feelings so it's that you know you pour the petrol over those roots splash the rest of the petrol you know, against the tree and you just set fire to the thing all of those roots die. They get disconnected. They get released. It's almost like the blockage has been removed. It's amazing, I've got this vacuum cleaner, it's really powerful. And they're probably surprised I've moved away from talking about a burning tree to a vacuum cleaner, but when it gets blocked, it's absolutely useless. And it does get blocked. Maybe it, it could be something like a piece of paper or something that I didn't realise it sucked it up because it's so powerful. 
it sucks stuff up really quickly. But when it's blocked, absolutely crap, really rubbish. And what I do is I get um, a broom handle and I push it down the down the thing and I unblock it. And what's weird is once I connect it back, it sucks up the stuff that was blocking it originally and it sucks out fine and still stays fine. It's almost like what the collection of those things together blocked it, but once they were separate, once that toilet paper and a bit of fluff and maybe I was going to say a bit of chocolate, but there's no way a bit of chocolate would ever manage to land on the floor. I would catch it with my mouth. So you separate it. It doesn't have the same power to block the vacuum cleaner. Just as when you start separating the roots from the actual trigger in the tree just changes and sometimes just the idea of it you know your unconscious mind may like that idea it might oh I like that idea that idea a lot and then decide to go along and just start burning some of those trees, some of those triggers that maybe need to be got rid of they're no longer useful maybe they used to be useful it's quite nice to if you can look at things in a positive way it might seem a bit false and maybe it is, I don't know but just to think that maybe the trigger was there. You could say, well, how can the trigger be there? That can that be useful? It's allowed you to gain access to those feelings that you no longer need. So it's not blocked. It was no longer blocked. It's free now. And what happens is the more trees, the more triggers you burn down, the ground starts to die. So all those other triggers, those negative triggers, because that's where all the neg negative triggers all live together. You know, it's, it's just natural. They uh, suffering and pain and negativity and anger, they, they like their own company, they like to be with their own people, you know, anger loves to be around, and so it's misery loves company, that's an old saying, isn't it, so the ground starts to die, and the, it gets to a point where you don't even have to start worrying about burning all of the trees down, because they're going to start rotting. So those connections to other negative stuff, the emotional connections, start to just free themselves. And because this is energy, energy never dies. It just transforms into something else. So you don't, you don't destroy the negative energy. You change it. You change it back to that pure energy where it could become whatever is needed. So it's no longer attached to a negative thought or a negative memory or a negative behavior. It's just energy. And then you realize.
realised that you never were broken. You never were broken. That's just something that you've told yourself. Maybe other people have said it as well. But that's words. It's not true. You never were broken and you never will be. You were affected. And rightly so. When something awful happens, we're supposed to be affected by it. Because then we can do something about it. We can learn from it. It means that we're human. It means that you're being kind to yourself by allowing yourself to feel. Which also opens up your ability to feel more of the lovely stuff, more of the wonderful feelings, the happiness, the feeling good for no good reason. Just feeling good because it's a nice day, or even if it's raining, so what? So, this is a little bit longer than I expected it to be, but I did think it was it was going to be one of my rambles. So there you go. It's a nice, nice or horrible ramble, whichever way you look at it. If you're still listening, then um, hopefully you got something from it. And the more time you spend listening to me, is less time you spend thinking negatively. The more time you spend listening to me, the less time you feel anxious or stressed. And your mind starts to change. Like physically change, not just emotionally, not just uh, thinking, but physically your brain starts to heal. The way you think changes because our brains are plastic. They're not made made of plastic, but they are... um, They have plasticity. They continuously grow. They're continuously changing. The old idea of you know, oh, you can't, can't, t- what was it? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. In other words, once someone's learned something, they get to a certain age, they can't learn anything new. Well, that's not true. Never has been, never will be. And I think the only way it can be true is if that's what you believe. what we believe affects every fibre of our being so you believing that listening to me helps you believing that that actually from now on things are going to be different in a positive healthy healing way You believe that you deserve to be happy. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to be kind to yourself. You deserve to be happy. Say that to yourself. Actually say it now. If you're still awake, if you haven't fallen asleep. Say it. I deserve to be happy. And notice how it feels. And keep saying it to yourself. I don't mean like constantly forever. You know, you do have to, you've got other things to do, I'm sure. But keep saying it to yourself every now and then. You get a spare few minutes. Maybe, you know, you're brushing your teeth. I deserve to be happy. Especially when you're looking in the mirror. 
So if you're brushing your hair, trimming your beard, flossing, um, trimming your nose hairs, I don't know, just uh, practicing your mime, miming or whatever in front of the mirror, say it to yourself, even out loud maybe, because you're looking at yourself in the eyes. You're connecting your own image to the words, I deserve to be happy. You do deserve to be happy. So be kind to yourself. Because you deserve to be happy. And that is the end of this here recording for now. But I shall still return. You bet on it. I will. And I'm going to do another recording on triggers. And another one. And another one. And another one. But don't worry, I'm not going to do loads all in one go. So I guess... Yeah. That's the end of this recording. So take care. Remember to be kind to yourself. You deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye.